<laughs> I feel like Forrest Gump. Run, Forrest! Wonder Hussy here. <laughs> I've been out in the field for, oh gosh, over a month now. And I really need to go home to Vegas to take care of some stuff, check my mail. But unfortunately, there's this terrible heat wave going on down there right now. It's supposed to be like 115 degrees this weekend. And it just doesn't sound very pleasant. So I decided to stay out in the field shooting videos for a few more days before I head back. The only bummer is it's the middle of summer. It's July 10th and well, kids are out of school. People are antsy because they've been cooped up because of the coronavirus quarantine. And to make matters even worse, today's a Friday, it's the weekend. So there's a lot of people on the road and all the places that I wanted to go shoot videos are too crowded. What to do? I just wanna be in the middle of nowhere with no one around me. So I decided to hit the road and take the loneliest road in America, which is supposedly US Highway 50 or the portion of US Highway 50 that passes through the state of Nevada. Now, technically US 50 enters Nevada uh, on the California border on the west side over in South Lake Tahoe. And then it goes through uh, Carson City um, even though Nevada is a very sparsely populated state, there are a couple of pretty major population areas, one being down in Vegas in the south, and then the other one being kind of like the Reno, Tahoe, Carson City metro area. And that metro sprawl kind of extends all the way east through the town of Fallon, Nevada. So it's not really until you get through Fallon that the really desolate country begins. You know what I mean? Like after you leave Fallon, the highway turns to only two lanes. And well, as you can see, there's not a whole lot of traffic on it. Now, US Highway 50 actually runs across the entire country from Sacramento to Maryland, but it's just that portion that crosses through Nevada that was dubbed the loneliest road in America by Life Magazine back in 1986. And it wasn't meant to be a compliment. I think they were bagging on it. But the Nevada State Board of Tourism ran with it because you know there's plenty of people who love a lonely road. And now it's a huge marketing stick. You can buy loneliest road t-shirts and loneliest road shot glasses and loneliest road baseball hats. <laughs> well, like all marketing stick, I'm curious to find out if there's any truth to it. Now, I have driven portions of US 50 in the past but I've never actually gone the whole way. And the portions that I went on were pretty desolate, but I'm curious to see if the rest of it is really as lonely as they say. So my plan is to drive the entire length of US 50 all the way to the Utah border and find out. Okay, wow, I've barely left Fallon and it's already pretty desolate. <laughs> I lost cell signal almost immediately after I left town. And well, you can see, passing cars are few and far between. But as I was driving along, I did notice that there's this kind of, well, quirky tradition out here in the barren wastes. And when I say barren waste, I mean barren. There's not even like sagebrush or anything, but it looks like, I guess the tradition is for people to pick up these black volcanic rocks and then spell out their names on the, well, on the embankment there. See what I mean? It looks like somebody wrote, I guess this is J Moore. And then over here, somebody wrote love with a big old hippie P sign for an O. Gosh, there's just all kinds of names going all up and down this highway. And incidentally, I should note that, yeah, there's been a few cars passing in the background while I'm making this, but keep in mind, it is the middle of summer and it's a Friday afternoon. So if I was here like on a Tuesday in November, I bet there'd be nobody out here. Hmm, might have to come back. Okay, wow, look at this. Holy cow! 
out. I don't know if you were able to make that out, but somebody took the time to write out the entire first paragraph of the United States Constitution. Now that's patriotism. Wow, there is no traffic on this road. I could just run right down the middle of it. Like Forrest Gump, remember? Run, Forrest! Okay, gosh, for being a lonely road, there sure is a lot of weird and fascinating stuff along this highway. So now we just came into this big desolate valley and I saw a sign that said low flying aircraft. And then I saw another sign that said Naval B-17 range. I mean, I know there's a big, I think Air Force base in Fallon, but I don't know about Naval, but look at this. <sighs> Warning! Restricted area! Keep out! Unlawful to enter without permission of the commanding officer of the naval... Oh, that is in Fallon. Okay. Wow. Internal Security Act of 1950. What are you guys trying to hide out there? You know what I mean? They do all this shady stuff out in the middle of nowhere in Nevada because they figure there's nobody out here to get wise to their shenanigans. Well, little do they know that everyone on their Aunt Sally is traveling this highway nowadays. Yes, that's right. I am a little disgruntled that there's so much highway noise in the background. <laughs> Dang weekends. That's why I'm a big fan of doing things during the week whenever possible. But, well, like I said, I had to do something on the weekend and I thought this was going to be desolate. Ah, damn government. Look at this. Okay, so in the state of Nevada, they have these Nevada shaped blue markers uh, at these points of historical interest. And apparently there was a really cool old uh, mining town called Fairview that according to the sign had 27 saloons, hotels, banks, assay offices, a newspaper, post office, and a miners union hall. I mean, gosh, it must be amazing ruins, but guess what? <laughs> it's behind the fence on that dang government base. So they have the sign here, uh, it says it's one and a half miles south of here, but unfortunately it's completely inaccessible to people like me. Okay, oh my god, I'm driving along and I saw another Nevada State Historical Marker out of the corner of my eye. And look at this one! Wonder! <laughs> Almost all the letters have peeled off. It's an omen! I mean, according to the sign, 13 miles to the north is the Camp of Wonder, a major mining center in the early years of the 20th century. Uh, the Wonder Mining Company. Shut the front door. <laughs> you know, now that I think about it, I think somebody did email me about that place once. And I looked it up and there's not really a lot of remains left. So, you know, 13 mile detour. I still have a long way to go. I'm poking along here. I've, <laughs> I don't even think I'm like 50 miles from Fallon yet. Better save Wonder for another time. Okay, another pit stop. And this one is a doozy. Will you just look at this? Now, doesn't that just say it all? Nowhere, Nevada. Uh, I'd say that is a pretty accurate description that way. And that way. And well, gosh, just about anyway. <laughs> and it does look like there's a bunch of stickers on this pipe here. I wonder if it's kind of like a little what do you call that? Where they put goodies in it? Like an ammo can? Oh, just rope. I got all excited. I thought there might be like a trail register or something. What does it say? Houdini? Well, gosh, I guess I better add my sticker. I'll put it right uh, by this Mild Hogs sticker. They seem like good people. <laughs> Sounds like, like a friendly biker gang. The Mild Hogs. There's mine. Okay, back on the road. Man, I'm never gonna make it to Utah at this rate. There's too many interesting things to stop and look at. Okay, one thing I should mention is that tourists stick or no, this is some pretty desolate territory. I mean, after you leave Fallon, I think it's a, just a little bit over 400 miles to the Utah border. And in that 400 mile stretch, there's really not any services to speak of. I mean, you pass through 
I was gonna say three and a half towns, but it's really more like one and three half towns. I mean, Ely is the only town of any reasonable size, uh, and that's pretty far over towards Utah. And I think, I don't even know if that's big enough for a Walmart, to be honest. But then you also go through Austin, which I've made a video about and is basically a living ghost town. And then Eureka, which is, well, I've never made a video there yet, but it's even more of a ghost town than Austin. And then this place where I am right now, Middle Gate Station, which is, well, it's really just a bar. And I don't even know if it's open right now because of the dang coronavirus, but I've been in there before. It's kind of like a bar with uh, burgers and such and like crazy stuff hanging all over the walls, dollar bills and bras and everything. But yeah, it looks like it's closed. So unfortunately we can't go in there today. But to that end, speaking of how desolate it is out here, you know, you really have to be prepared if you're traveling through this part of the country. I think back in that Time Magazine article that gave this the loneliest road America name, they did uh, say only the most, what they say, something like, only those who are prepared with survival skills should drive this highway, something like that. <laughs> like it's really hardcore. And well, to be honest, it is pretty hardcore. There's, it's not like you can stop at a convenience store and get a Coke or use the bathroom or anything. No siree. If you're traveling along the loneliest road in America and you gotta take a tinkle, well then sister, you better learn to pop a squat. And moreover, you know, if you break down, there's a lot of stretches that don't even have cell signal. So you really do have to be well provisioned. And to that end, well, I've been on the road, like I said at the beginning of the video for like a month. And I did stock up before I left. I got five gallons of drinking water. I've got recovery tracks in case I get stuck in the sand. Obviously I've got my bed and my cooking supplies and you know, everything I need to stay relatively clean. And then I have about, oh gosh, five, six days worth of food if I really need it. But no joke, man. It's not like there's McDonald's or a rest area or anything along this highway. You have to bring everything you need. Okay, look, I'll drive past this middle gate station so you can see what I'm talking about. Pretty sure that motel sign is a joke or out of date because the one time that I stayed here, I just sort of slept in my car in the parking lot. They allow overnight parking. And I don't even know if these gas pumps work. And you don't want to end up like that guy, which is why I topped off my gas in Fallon. And well, that should be plenty to get me all the way to Ely. There is a gas station in Austin, but I have a feeling it's going to be super expensive. So I'm probably not gonna stop to get any gas there although I might have to go in and get a cold drink because oh man it is hot like I said it's July 10th and we're at like 4,000 feet on this stretch of the highway and it's like in the 90s it is a sweltering day and then there's this kind of overcast sky sort of making it seem even more oppressive but once we get up into the mountains by Austin and Eureka it should cool down considerably OMG, I don't know if you can see that U-Haul van over there, but gosh, for being on the loneliest road in America, I sure am having some interesting experiences. The people driving that U-Haul were coming from Tombstone, Arizona. They just bought a property up the road in Austin and they're gonna open a Berlansk desk hall, dance hall, excuse me. <laughs> Stumbling over my words because, well, this guy, it's, he's a character, his name is Beto well, I don't know how you pronounce his last name. He's Basque, but there's no S in it. So, Beto Bach. And gosh, if you read his card, he does a little bit of everything. He was just your classic kind of Wild West, Mark Twain, fast talking, snake oil salesman, burlesque hall owning, good time person, amazing guy. And well, he offered me a nip of Grand Marnier here at the side of the loneliest road in America. And how could I say no? So I better make some coffee or something and sober up. But the reason I pulled over here was not to meet some random guy in a U-Haul van, believe it or not. The reason I pulled over here is this. It's another historical marker for the Rock Creek Cold Spring Station on the Pony Express Trail. That's right, there's actually a lot of history to this US 50 Lonely's Road in America. I mean, obviously when they lay out these highways, they follow uh, established paths and this, was originally the route the Pony Express took. Now, if you are unfamiliar with the Pony Express, before they had uh, mail service here in the, well, what's now the United States, and I guess was then the United States, before they had mail service, 
think about it. Like they didn't have air mail. If you wanted to write a letter, like say your son went out to California in 1849 to go discover gold and make his fortune. And his poor mom is, you know, back east in Pittsburgh and she's worried about him. Well, he wants to send her a letter so that she knows he's okay. And it's not like he can send it by air mail, you know? <laughs> they had this thing called the Pony Express where these guys would ride ponies all the way from the east to California. And I think they would ride them about 10 miles at a stretch. I don't know all the information about it. I read a little bit about it because I was considering, well, I was considering following the whole route and making a video. But my recollection is that they would go 10 miles at a stretch because they would really ride the horse hard to make good time. So they had these really small, kind of like built like jockeys, these small uh, slight of stature cowboys that are, I don't even know if they were cowboys, they were just horse riders, but they would ride all out for 10 miles from one station to the next and then when they got to that station they would change horses get a next horse and go the next 10 miles because the horse would be like completely exhausted especially going through this well hot dry terrain but it's really cool because there's well obviously every 10 miles there was a pony express station and a lot of them are marked on this highway they have this really cool little historical marker on the highway a little sign that says pony express trail and it points to uh, any place where there's actually the ruins of a station. Here's a little sign, let me see what this says. Oh, this is a different marker. This is for the California Trail. Holy moly. Gosh, there's all kinds of trails intersecting here. So the Pony Express Trail and station was completely different. This was for the pioneers, the old time pioneers. Like if you watch that series I made about the Donner Party where I followed the route the Donner Party took all the way to California. Well, they were actually considerably north of here more like along i-80 is the route they took but i guess plenty of pioneers took this central route too i'm not sure why must have been some difference as to where they were coming from or something like that there's a couple more plaques over here let me see what these say there goes there goes beto man that guy was a character i'm not kidding he said he's buying uh an old property in goldfield nevada and tularosa new mexico the, he's from Tombstone, okay? He's one of those Wild West actors down there, the gunslingers and everything. Man, I have faith that he is actually going to do what he said, too, because he opened up the back of the U-Haul and showed me what he had in there, and it was packed to the brim with funky old Wild West lamps and pottery and costumes and sombreros and... Oh man, I felt like I was running away to join the circus. I wanted to jump in the back and go with them wherever they're going, but unfortunately... I'm on a mission to the Utah border, and at this rate, oh my gosh, I'm never going to get there. What time is it? Oh, it's almost four o'clock already. Dang, I'm not even in Austin yet. Okay, this sign just says uh, about cold springs. I guess there's some kind of little spring out here, which water is so scarce. Of course, anywhere there was water, they would build some kind of little way station. So you can pause it and read the whole thing if you want. But it just talks a little bit about Pony Express and the Pioneers, and then, well, then it does show how, here's a map. Let's see, the Pony Express route was this line, and then the dotted line was the telegraph, when they started the telegraph. Wow, that's cool. And then this dotted line is the stagecoach route. Oh my gosh, there was a central overland stagecoach route that came through here. And then this is uh, US 50, which was originally actually the Lincoln Highway. I think it was, the, like I said earlier in the video, the first uh, transcontinental highway that was built, the first paved highway from coast to coast, was along this route. And that was called the Lincoln Highway. Okay, and then this other sign is really cool because apparently there's ruins here, okay? If we're, we're here in this little rest area and then across the highway, over there where that U-Haul pulled out, that's the, uh, there's like a bathroom and a rest area. Well, there's apparently a Pony Express station ruin over there. And then over here, there's a stagecoach station ruin and a telegraph station ruin. Oh, man, as much as I would love to hike to these ruins and check them out, I gotta get back on the road, man. Like I said, it's already almost four o'clock and I'm not even in Austin yet. And if I wanna, well, I was gonna allow myself two days to do this road, but whew, like I said, it's gonna be more like a week at this pace. So I guess realistically, the ruins are probably just piles of rocks anyways. They're probably not that interesting. But if you are interested in taking this route for yourself sometime, well, I'm gonna go ahead and suggest that you allocate yourself about at least a month. Okay, back on the road. Oh wait, man, I was barely back on the road for 15 seconds and I saw these ruins out of the corner of my eye. This is the ruins of the old transcontinental telegraph station. 
Wow, I didn't even think about that. The telegraph. It says in 1860, Congress passed a bill to subsidize the construction of a transcontinental telegraph line. Wow, I guess that put the Pony Express out of business. It says here, the Pony Express took 11 days to get mail coast to coast or from Missouri to California. But a telegraph, well, you could send a message in minutes. Oh, wow. And then this is interesting. It says the telegraph was invented by Samuel Morse, obviously Morse code, who was an artist rather than a scientist. Beating scientists to the punch, Morse figured out how to send impulses through wires over long distances. Interesting. I didn't know he was an artist. That's cool. Oh, but look. Although the telegraph was incomparably faster than Pony Express, it was very expensive. As much as 75 cents a word. Wow. Can you imagine 75 cents a word? So you would really, unless you were independently wealthy, like Leland Stanford or one of those uh, Gilded Age Barons, you would really save a, a telegraph for only the most important messages. Like if, you know, your mom passed away or something, you could send a, well, you'd have to cough up a dollar fifty to send a message that said, mom died. And it really puts into perspective how spoiled we are and how much we take stuff for granted. Like nowadays you can send a text message to the moon, basically, saying something stupid like L-O-L-O-M-G-I-D-K and it really doesn't cost much at all. Boy, how times have changed. I guess that's why talk is so cheap now. I mean, look at this friggin' landscape. You can just sort of see a Pony Express rider hauling ass across this sagebrush flat. You know? If I pan just a little bit more, well, you might could see that white truck in that bathroom in the distance, but that's pretty much the only thing to remind you that we're in the year 2020. Because this here looks just like the old days. Oh, wow, yikes, look at this. Nice, peaceful sagebrush. And <laughs> you start walking, and it's a horror show, oh my god! There's like... I guess if I just stomp, I can do it. It's like these crickets everywhere. Thousands of them. Yikers. Hey, at least it's not Mormon crickets. If you watched that video I made last summer, my sister and I were <laughs> camping in this general area and there was an infestation. I guess it's like a cyclical thing. Every so many years, they get this thing called Mormon crickets that are <sighs> a thousand times worse than these little guys. Watch the video. I mean, it was horrifying. I'm hoping that because it's a cyclical thing and they were here last summer, they won't be here this summer. I haven't seen any yet, but if there are, I ain't camping out. I'm getting a hotel, let me tell you. Anyway, I just stopped because I wanted to take a picture of this cool Pony Express thing. Carry on. Okay, now we're coming up on Austin and I'm not gonna stop and shoot anything here because I already made a whole video about Austin and you can check that out. I'll put the link up here. It's a cool little town. Like I said earlier, it's a semi-ghost town, kind of on the brink of dying, but, well, that's what was neat about that burlesque entrepreneur dude that I met at the rest stop back there is, supposedly, he just bought or leased uh, the old mercantile building in Austin. He's gonna turn it into some kind of burlesque hall or saloon or, you know, Old West tourist attraction because he's all about trying to keep these, well, these semi-ghost towns alive. According to him, there's only a hundred people that still live in Austin. And it's hanging out by its toenails. In fact, he said he had to get a P.O. box to get mail here and they didn't even charge him for it because they desperately need people with addresses here or they're gonna close the post office down altogether. So they basically gave it to him for free. Well, it looks like they're doing some road work in Austin, which is interesting because well, that looks expensive and I guess well, I guess there's funds for something up here. That's cool. Kind of ruins the vibe though, you know, this cute little quaint little Old West town. But this is Austin, just like you saw in my other video. Oh gosh, it's like 5.30 almost. I guess I should start thinking about finding a place to camp. I don't think I want to go quite as far as Eureka today, but I was looking uh, online while I was waiting back there for the road construction. We were stopped for quite a while. Uh, I looked on my one of my favorite websites, freecampsites.net, and saw this. Looks like there's a pretty cool campground up ahead with uh, petroglyphs, a bunch of petroglyphs. So I'm going to see if I can go stay there. Free BLM campground. Free. Uh-oh. Oh, oh my god, Mormon crickets. I knew it. Ah. 